what COVID did in my family was try to separate us, even in the household that we live in. The coronavirus pandemic has disproportionately impacted American Indians and Alaska Natives. One in 390 Indigenous persons in this country has died from COVID-19. And I mean, that's just an incredible number. A 747 airplane seats about 400 people. So it's kind of like every time you load that plane, one person dies out of that crowd. One of the reasons Indigenous Americans were hit so hard by the pandemic is because their communities lacked basic resources to take preventative measures. We have communities that don't even have running water. When the CDC put out the recommendations that said you needed to wash your hands for 20 seconds in warm water, my question to them was, where are we supposed to get this warm water from in places where there has been no infrastructure built to bring water to our communities? My youngest was breastfeeding at the time and my fear was touching her, touching my mask, reaching out, wondering what was going on, why, why was I so sick? Why couldn't I play with her? Why couldn't I get up and take care of her? It was very difficult. Tribal nations and the U.S. government negotiated treaties as a result of the atrocities the government inflicted on Native people. Part of the treaty rights included federally funded health care for American Indians and Alaska Natives. But according to experts and Indigenous leaders, the government has never fully funded the programs, leading to a lack of resources and inadequate care. Here's how federally funded health care for American Indians and Alaska Natives works in the U.S. and what reforms tribal communities want to see. The United States government has a horrific history when it comes to American Indians. Throughout U.S. history, the government forced indigenous people from their land and stripped them of resources and rights. As a result of that, our treaties say that we have a right to health care provided by the federal government. This is meant to be quality health care provided to enrolled members of federally recognized tribes to health care free of charge in that we already paid for it with the land that the United States is on. The Indian Health Service, or IHS, was established in the mid-1950s as the fulfillment of those treaty rights. IHS provides funding and services for basic clinical care for American Indians and Alaska Natives. There are three different models that IHS facilities may fall under direct service, compacting, and contracting. Direct service is where the Indian Health Service operates a facility as a government-run system. Tribes have no control in how the program is run. Compacting, on the other hand, is when the federal government provides tribal nations with the money to run their own programs. It is completely under tribal control. Contracting is a combination between the two models, where federally recognized tribes will work with the IHS to plan, conduct, and administer programs that the IHS would otherwise provide. With contracting, IHS provides more oversight of the programs or facilities than a compacting model, and must approve substantial changes to any contract between the IHS and the tribe. A tribe is allowed to combine these three models to best meet the needs of its community. There are also urban Indian health programs that serve Indigenous Americans living in cities. These programs are supported by IHS, but are given a minimal amount of money. Most supplement their funding through federal, state, local, and private sources. These programs are key. They provide what is generally the only culturally attuned medical care resources and services to urban dwelling American Indians and Alaska Natives. According to a 2018 report from the Independent and Bipartisan Commission on Civil Rights, the U.S. government has not adequately funded federal programs for Native Americans. The commission found that in 2016, IHS received less funding per person enrolled in the program than Medicare, Medicaid, and Veteran Affairs. In 2016, IHS healthcare expenditures per person were around $2,800, compared to approximately 10 thousand dollars per person for federal health care spending nationwide. As a result of the chronic underfunding of the Indian Health Service, these facilities very often are not be able to provide more than primary medical care. If we don't get the resources that we need, it's always going to be a struggle for us to begin to address the underlying health conditions that were built as a result of the colonial oppression and suppression of both our health and our economic prosperity within Indian country. So until we see full funding of the Indian Health Service, we're always going to be struggling to do more than just provide the immediate needs of our people. The Indian Health Service did not respond to CNBC's request for comment. My name is Sarah Stronghorse Anderson. I'm an enrolled member of the Esalen Tribe of Monterey County. 
I work at the Seattle Indian Health Board as a patient care coordinator. Seattle Indian Health Board is a federally qualified health center. We provide care around an indigenous knowledge informed system of care, uh, everything surrounded uh, with traditional medicine. While it does receive some funding from IHS, the health board is independently run. We advocate for ourselves. We, we go out there and we get grants. We, we use our data to prove what we need. In addition to being an employee, Sarah also received care from the Seattle Indian Health Board when she came down with COVID in April 2020. The care that we received at the Seattle Indian Health Board was holistic. It was, it was fulfilling. It, it made me feel valued and cared for. I was in my home. I wasn't in the clinic, and yet I still was monitored. I, I was still treated with care. My provider called me on my phone to see how I was doing. The clinical team made sure that I had uh, O2 sat monitors to make sure that none of us were in dire need of critical medical attention. And because of those things and that care, we found out that there was a point where we did need that. Sarah said when her family called an ambulance to take her and her partner to the hospital, the EMTs refused to transport them. We took ourselves and I was admitted and he was admitted. And even that care, as careful as the hospitals were with us, with COVID, with being so sick, um, we didn't know what was going on. No one was telling us uh, what, was, what was going to happen next, if we were going to get better, if we could see each other. I just will never forget the difference in care that I saw between um, my clinical care at my, my Seattle Indian Health Mart, my family clinic, and the care that we received um, by the 911 staff and the hospital. I'm not discrediting their job as clinicians, but I felt it. I felt a difference. I felt that. We had to advocate for ourselves and we had to fight or something terrible could have happened to us. In addition to advocating for health care reform, tribal communities have also been calling for the creation of more infrastructure in Indian country. The Commission on Civil Rights wrote in its 2018 report that broken treaties have left many reservations without adequate access to critical resources, such as clean water, plumbing, electricity, internet, cell phone service, roads, public transportation, housing, hospitals, and education. It's just sad that in today's, you know, 2021, that uh, we have tribal communities that lack this basic infrastructure. This is uh, not on the onus on the Indian Health Service or the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but on the federal government and its um, inability to uphold the treaties and the treaty obligations that it's made with indigenous populations. Activists and experts say putting control of the system in the hands of indigenous people themselves makes a big difference in efficacy of initiatives. Let's give the power of our tribal nations to self-determine their own fate. Let's give them the money. Let's give them the government contracts. Let's let them have opportunity of programs to fit their own needs. They also advocate for more representation of Native people at federally run organizations such as the CDC. We cannot have very junior uh, CDC epidemiologists who are not Indian go into Indian country and try to figure out how do we work with this population during a pandemic. You know, this is not on the job training. COVID-19 highlighted the strengths and the resiliencies of Indigenous communities that the rest of this country should be learning from. These strengths and resiliencies of our communities is because we're what this nation has been trying to build, a public health community, where we think about ourselves not only as individuals, but as individuals who have a responsibility to the whole of a community. That's what public health is. 